today we'll be talking about the 2022 film, Elvis. Now sit back, relax, grab your drinks, and let's talk about this film. What's up, y'all, and welcome back to the Former Review. This is Season 5, Episode 10, and I thank you all for tuning in once again. Today, we will be talking about the musical biopic genre film and the newest addition to that genre, so stay tuned. Now, before I go into the full analysis of this film, I do want to preface it with a slight spoiler warning. As always, I will do my best not to spoil the film for you. However, it is a biopic, so it is based on an artist's life, so there may not be really that many surprises in it. But I, as always, I do suggest you go see the film before you having to hear what I have to say about it so you fully understand everything. However, if you just don't care about that, keep listening. Also, I know I talk about this at the end, but the data shows that most people don't listen to that part, so I want to talk about it here and reiterate the importance of leaving reviews on your favorite subscription services i do read those because i do want to grow because these episodes are really for all you listeners out there and i want to keep this entertaining so what do you want to hear do you want to hear games do you want to hear more of the 4k stuff do you want to hear me talk about a certain movie if you want to come on and talk to me about something if you want to debate i'm always open to do stuff like that so you can always reach out to me on social media i always want to grow and improve and just because something works doesn't mean that it cannot be improved. So, if there's something that you want me to improve on, let me know, and I will grow as such. Anyway, back to the film at hand. So sit back, relax, grab your drinks, and let's talk about this film. Elvis is a biographical musical drama film directed by Baz Luhrmann, who co-wrote the screenplay with Sam Bromo, Greg Pierce, and Jeremy Donner. It stars Austin Butler as Elvis Presley and Tom Hanks as his manager, Colonel Tom Parker, along with Olivia Dujange, Hella Thompson, Richard Roxborough, Kevin Harrison Jr., Xavier Samuel, David Wenham, Cody Smith-McPhee, and Luke Bracey in supporting roles. This film is a combination of two genres, musicals and biopics. Musical films developed from the stage musical after the emergence of sound and film technology. Typically, the biggest difference between this genre and the stage version is that the former uses, obviously, different backgrounds and locations that would be impractical in a theater. The performers will still, however, treat their song and dance numbers as if a live audience were watching them. The first big musical film was Victor Fleming's The Wizard of Oz, and it experimented with new technologies such as Technicolor. Then in the 1940s and 50s, musical films became more regular and relied on the star power of film stars such as Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly, Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, and Judy Garland. They also relied on songwriters such as Rodgers and Hammerstein and the Gershwin Brothers, to name a few. Then during the 1960s, films based on stage musicals continued to be box office and critical hits. Then in the 70s, the film zeitgeist and changing demographics of filmgoers moved more toward gritty realism while the theatricality of musicals was looked at as old-fashioned. Then throughout the 80s and 90s, Disney animated films were looked at as the majority of the musical film genre. Now, in the 21st century, the musical genre was reborn with darker musicals such as Sweeney Todd and also musical biopics such as this film. Now, biopic, or as some would call it a biopic, is a film that dramatizes the life of a non-fictional or historically based person or people. These films usually show the life of a historical person and the central character's real name is used. They differ a little bit from docudrama films and historical drama films in that they they attempt to comprehensively tell a single person's life story or at least most of the historically important years of their lives. And when you combine these two genres, the story is usually a telling of the life of a famous musician. Portraying a musical icon is a great way for an actor to showcase a triple threat talent of acting, singing, and then also potentially dancing. Now, in 2004, Jamie Foxx took home the Best Actor Oxford for his transformation into Ray Charles for the film Ray. Yo Queen Phoenix showed off his talent as Johnny Cash in Walk the Line. Marion Cotillard came out internationally with their Best Actors Oscar winning performance as Edith Pirat and La Vie en Rose. And most recently, both Rami Malek and Taron Egerton got awards for their portrayals of Freddie Mercury and Elton John, respectively. Now, the next artist on this list is Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. Elvis is regarded as one of the most significant cultural figures of the 20th century. He had interpretations of songs and added his his 
own sexually provocative performance style combined with a mix of influences across color lines during a very transformative era in race relations in the United States, which gave him a lot of success, but also a lot of controversy then and still continues to this day. Overall, he has sold over 500 million records worldwide and is recognized as the best selling solo music artist of all time by Guinness World Records. He is commercially successful in many genres, including pop, country, rhythm and blues, adult contemporary, and gospel. He won three Grammy Awards, received the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award at age 36, and has been inducted into multiple music halls of fame. He holds several records, including the most RIAA certified gold and platinum albums, the most albums charted on the Billboard 200, the most number one albums by a solo artist in the UK, and the most number one singles by any act in the UK singles chart. And then in 2018, Presley was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Now, his life is chronicled in this film from his modest Mississippi upbringing to the start of his career in Memphis in the 1950s, all the way through to his tragic and premature death in 1977. Now, the film plays out, as I've already talked about, as most biopics do, which isn't a bad thing per se. The film shows that prior to being a famous star, he grew up in poverty in Tupelo, Mississippi, and this is why he was the way he was, reinventing himself over and over again. He was essentially fearful of ending back where he came from. He once told a reporter in 1965 that, quote, I can never forget the longing to be someone. I know what poverty is. I lived it for a very long time, end quote. And because of this, his music could fall into many different genres over his career, including country, gospel, and R&B. He wasn't known for his writing ability, but his performance is and sound is what made him famous. But before he was famous, he had to be discovered first. And who essentially did that? Colonel Tom Parker, played in this film by Tom Hanks. Like Elvis, Parker came from somewhat humble beginnings. He was born in the Netherlands as Andreas Cornelius von Kujic. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. And in a way, he reinvented himself. Now, he illegally immigrated to the United States at the age of 17 and adopted the name Thomas Andrew Parker and afterwards claimed to be from West Virginia. And he essentially made his living as a carnival worker and then started working in the army but was discharged for psychotech in 1933, but the title colonel wasn't one that he got while he was in the army. He actually got it as an honorary title from the Louisiana state government. Now, fast forward to 1955, Parker became aware of Elvis because of his different singing style from the current trend, and he knew it that this style would be the future of music. And on March 26, 1956, after Presley's prior management contract had expired, Elvis signed a contract with Parker that made him his exclusive representative. Now, from 1956 to 1958, Elvis dominated the charts with hits like Heartbreak Hotel and his very suggestive dance moves gave him nickname of Elvis the Pelvis, and he was also called Racial Slurs for his affinity with black culture. Then in 1958, at the height of his fame, Parker actually started to believe that Presley's career wouldn't last longer than a year or two more. Then, when Elvis received his draft notice from the U.S. Army, Parker was secretly overjoyed, where as Elvis was upset about the possibility of it affecting his career. Now, Parker thought that the army stint would actually stop Elvis's rebellious feelings towards Parker, but also change anyone's opinion about Elvis. He thought that if Elvis could show the world that he was just the same as any other young man, more people would accept him and also his music. Now, during Elvis's service, he kept Elvis's name relevant, but didn't let him record because he insisted that it would ruin his reputation as a quote-unquote regular soldier if he would go into the recording studio studio and sing. However, even with this control that he had, Parker was anxious about any influence that Elvis might encounter in the service. As such, he sent Elvis's friends to keep him company, arrange for business associates to watch over him while they were already in Europe, and then also kept in regular contact with him via telephone or letter. Then when his service ended in 1960, Elvis returned to his singing career. Now, Parker's main view on pretty much everything was, quote, don't try to explain it, just sell it, end quote. He really only cared about promotion.
promotion and negotiation. And he even profited from people who didn't like Elvis selling I hate Elvis pins alongside his I love Elvis one. He basically just could get money from anything. So essentially, however Elvis succeeded would help him succeed. And he contractually took 25% on all of his clients' earnings and then 50% for licensing and merchandise. From the beginning, Elvis had a lot of admiration toward Parker. However, towards the end of his life, their relationship completely changed. He felt trapped by the contracts the colonel had signed for him during the 60s and 70s, and this resentment work became worse when he became addicted to drugs and also the colonel started going through some gambling addictions. The film establishes Parker as the obvious antagonist of the story as he himself admits that he was the villain of Elvis's rise and fall. The entire film's narrative is delivered from his viewpoint. Now, Lerman said he did this because, quote, any storytelling, even a documentary, is just somebody's telling somebody's truth, end quote. He even said that, quote, Parker is a pretty unreliable storyteller, but then again, who isn't? If you told me the story of something that happened last night and I told you the story, we tell it differently, end quote. And as with all biopics, the film does condense the story of Elvis's life. There is a lot left out, but all the key moments do appear. His discovery in 1954, the cultural explosions of his first live shows, the 1968 comeback special, his reinvention in the Vegas in the 70s, and, and then some of the things in between. It does touch on some of the African-American roots of the musical genre that Elvis popularized, but focuses more on the complicated relationships between him and Parker, and the impact that his fame had on his family somewhat, and then showing shows a fairly heartbreaking depiction of his final years. And this is all presented in Lerman's signature cinematic style. And this is what makes the film stand out a little bit in comparison to other biopics, even if the style is preferred over substance. However, depending on one's view of the style, we'll have them enjoying it or hating it because it is everywhere. One thing that Lerman does very well is not showing Butler as Elvis right off the bat. He has the audience meet Colonel Parker because he is the narrator of the story and Elvis is essentially this mythical figure that the audience can easily become enamored by and Austin Butler's performance of Elvis is absolutely magnificent even if one was born decades after Elvis's real life death it's very easy to see that Austin embodied who Elvis was his incredible performance is what really keeps this film worth watching for the film's very long runtime he is able to capture so much of Elvis's essence and even gets the smallest mannerisms down that fans will associate with Elvis. Now, Lerman's editing in this film, while entertaining at times, can also be a bit much. And the runtime is felt as there are moments of the film that leave little interest to care about. With the nearly three hour runtime, the film does cover Elvis's entire life from beginning until his grave. However, there are moments that are brushed over, so much so that there's little time to care about some of the characters and their development. The first third of the film is very guilty of this, and felt like Lerman was trying to do too much. The film very much tiptoes around his relationship with Priscilla, who was 14 when they first met. And the film does show, like I said, some of where Elvis got his inspiration from, but really does not go into the great debate of Elvis's role in music history. Now, many have said that Elvis is a cultural appropriator. Historically speaking, rock and roll came from R&B, and many have stated things along the lines that, quote, rock and roll was the rhythm and blues repackaged for white audiences audiences, end quote. And this is not helped by the fact that when Parker first heard Elvis, he thought Elvis was black. At that time, the black press also was proudly discussing the influence of black music on Elvis, but not to chastise him for cultural appropriation, but to applaud his taste in black music because they were being denied radio and television airtime and often were looked down upon. Now, Presley himself was also not ignorant to his musical influences. He once said, quote, a lot of people seem to think I started this business, but rock and roll was here long before I came along. No one can sing that kind of music like colored people. Let's face it, I can't sing like Fats Domino's can, end quote. Rock and roll, undeniably, was pioneered by black artists such as Chuck Berry, Little Richard, and Bo Diddley. Now, this is to say that black music was created by black artists, not that it means that only black people can play it. Elvis did cover many songs that were originated by black artists such as Big Mama's Thornton's Hound Dog and Little Richard's Tutti Frutti. Now, is Elvis a borrower or is he a cultural appropriator? Honestly, he could be both. American music and also music 
Music in general has thrived on cultural exchange and appropriation, and Elvis was not the first or even the last white artist to draw from black music. One can even look at the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or even current musical artists like Eminem to see this. Acknowledging cultural appropriation is not a bad thing. Honestly, if one thinks about their actual life, there's a lot of evidence of this existing. If one thinks that everything in their life is authentic, then they may be just unaware about how many foreign traditions are there due to cultural appropriation. I mean, look at how many people do yoga now. How many people like tribal tattoos? Society as a whole enjoys all the nice things that other cultures have to offer, but they disregard all of the difficult parts of those cultures' history. And one of the biggest cultures to have this is black culture. From music to slang to fashion, white culture has taken a lot from the black community and used as trends. When it comes to music specifically, Eminem, Elvis, Iggy Azalea, Robin Thicke, Macklemore, Ariana Grande are all guilty of taking an art form created by the black community and using it to express themselves, which in turn makes them, their record labels, producers, a lot of money. Now, not all of them are inherently doing evil things with this, and one should not feel guilty for enjoying their music. As not all white people are responsible for the oppressions of individuals of other races, that doesn't mean the effects of those actions don't still impact people today. When looking at the music of Elvis, he was able to play similar music to that of black musicians on bigger stages because of his race. And as such, he had a higher platform, more privilege, and was awarded more opportunities. In recent years, Eminem has had similar comics made about him, no matter if one loves or hates his music. If you've been living under a rock, Eminem is a white rapper who made a name for himself with his controversial music and his blatant disregard for rules or really who he might offend. Now, as a teenager, he used rap to vent his frustrations in a way that's not dissimilar to the original rappers who were black. For those who don't know, rap originally was a form of poetry first used in the 1970s by black kids who would write lines about their frustrations around life in the ghetto. It also became a way of fighting back against white privilege and also the oppression the black community faced. The musical genre gave an opportunity for people to express themselves artistically, but it didn't really hit big time until other cultures started noticing the money-making potential of it. And one could easily say that Eminem used his white privilege and became famous off of the work of his black predecessors. And this is something that Eminem is aware of as he has acknowledged it in some of his songs. He's aware of his privilege, but he regularly uses his platform to promote other black rappers. So really, he is guilty of appropriating black culture, but he's also an ally in a way because he's able to give back to the community and he acknowledges that he is gaining success from it, but he's also allowing other people to benefit from that success. He's not only using it for himself. However, there are artists that differ from this, such as Iggy Azalea. Now, again, if you don't know who that is, Iggy Azalea is a white woman rapper who became famous around 2012 after being signed by another rapper, T.I. However, her real life Australian accent did not match up with her deep South accent in her songs. And her songs don't really have much depth or feeling to them talking about partying cars and being rich whereas Eminem's music emulates emotion and has depth it deals with sadness anger happiness passion and while there may be some black rappers that do talk about partying cars and being rich Iggy's music is more about making people dance and bringing in money than really honoring the art that she's participating in in 2014, she received four Grammy nominations for doing what black artists have already been doing, and they received no credit. This was also the same year that Kendrick Lamar lost the Best Rap Album Grammy to Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, who are both white, and their music and album was considered to be more of the pop genre. Macklemore did acknowledge, though, the weirdness of the situation and even wrote a song called White Privilege 2, where he acknowledged his white privilege and his appropriation of black music. Iggy Azalea has done no such thing and she's the clear example of what cultural appropriation of black culture is with no acknowledgement no honor or anything back to the culture that she has benefited from so to bring this full circle this appropriation would still happen if we were living in the same time as elvis because of the already existing disparities between blacks and whites at the time elvis was already going to get more radio play and record sales than black artists because they didn't have the same opportunities as him this shows that the problem of cultural appropriation is 
more a societal issue. Elvis didn't really steal black music, but he certainly appropriated it and profited from it within an unjust and discriminatory system. And this system still exists today to an extent, but there are artists like Eminem or even Macklemore that acknowledge that it happens and try to do something about it. Now, is it a bad thing that Elvis did what he did? Is he a culture approaching devil? Honestly, it's up to the individual. And frankly, no matter which way you fall on that, neither of you are wrong. Both are fair points to be made. Now, the film touches on this idea, but it doesn't make it a significant part of the film. And this is one of the biggest attributes of Elvis's story. While that may be a purposeful choice by Lerman because it's a story being told by a man who was most likely racist, that doesn't really make it an okay decision. However, we'll say Lerman does deserve credit on showing the direct connection between the black community and Elvis at the time, so there's no doubt that he got his inspiration from them. Overall, the film is a really unique telling of a cultural icon, and Lerman's style may be a little bit out there. The shining star of it is very much so Austin as the title character. He does a fantastic sauce and deserves all the praise he's been getting so far. This film is a very stylized telling of Elvis's story, but it has a very authentic and phenomenal portrayal by Austin that will have one wanting to listen to Elvis's music afterwards. The film succeeds with its story, its ending, its direction, and its message, but struggles with its details. So at overall, I would rate this film a 4 out of 5. Now what did you think of it, and where does it stand on your ranking of musical biopics? Let me know. Hit me up on social media. The formal review is on Facebook, Twitter, and the Gram, and also YouTube. The handle's all the same. It's at the formal review. Don't forget to subscribe to any of the platforms, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, anywhere where you can find a podcast on Spotify, or even subscribe to the channel on YouTube. You can also check out The Painted Lines, where I also contribute a few other ways. And please leave a review on there so I can know how to improve, because that's really how I grow as a human being. And I want to keep this show entertaining for you all. And for anyone who has supported me on a financial basis, I thank you very much for supporting me in that way. For anyone who wants to support, you can go to anchor.fm forward slash the formal review. Click support this podcast and any donation is appreciated. Thank you all again for tuning in. And until next time, be happy, enjoy life, and be positive. And see you at the movies. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the formal review. Cheers. And we'll see you next time.